Hi, thanks for joining me today. Um, my name's Tim O'Neill. I work for a company called Avolution, and today I'm going to talk about three secret weapons that we as enterprise architects need to succeed. So just a quick little introduction about myself. As I said, I, I work for a company called Avolution. Um, I've been in this, this game for you know, certainly more than 20 years. Um, I started out in academia, um, did professor work and all that, and now I've been with the company for, for um, yeah, over, over 20 years, working on some pretty cool um, projects. As a company themselves, you know, I don't need to go into this too much, but you know, there's many, many thousands of clients. We're certainly leader in the uh, magic quadrant and um, the number one on the critical capability analysis um, just recently. So really, let's get on to the topic of today's um, talk. I mean, as you can see here, I guess really what we're going to try and um, talk about is how you know not all superheroes wear capes. You know, we we as enterprise architects, we know that we work um, right at the forefront of some of the the most cutting and most interesting topics that businesses are confronting today. So some of the big challenges around, as we all know, we're sure we're all getting all those emails at the moment about GDPR and privacy here in Europe. But you know, we have a hand to play. In, you know, business strategy, of course, and road mapping and portfolio management. And you know, we've even got involved in you know large acquisitions between two companies and how you're going to kind of mash two different businesses together and look for the synergy savings and things like that. So these are pretty critical analysis pieces that enterprise architects, of course, have a, a seat at the table to try and guide the future direction that a company might want to take. What we're seeing is there's a number of forces really here at play. So essentially, um, we've kind of broken these up into these four C's. We talk about the cloud forces. So there's an entire push, obviously everything in the cloud, you know, the um, companies are moving away from having their own data centers and you know, moving to Amazon and Azure and all those different um, providers to you know, basically have their own um, you know, private clouds and in many cases are just a part of the public cloud. So you know, a lot of applications out there that are only available in the public cloud. Then we move across to the big challenge, the big force of connectivity. At the moment, you know, we're looking at you know, what traditionally was seen as the business as being pushed further and further out. Gartner have a phrase which they talk about outside out, and that's where you're starting to have your ecosystem of suppliers and providers outside of your actual business itself collaborating together and then you trying to look for those um, advantages of understanding and appreciating that landscape and seeing how you can position your own organization within that ecosystem of, of companies in your space. And then the whole internet of things, you know, that is pushing the edge or the access side of your enterprise right out potentially into customers' homes and things like that. So certainly the, the ability to connect these millions of, of devices in you know, smart cities and things like that is a big driver. Unfortunately, though, we've got that whole legacy of complexity. So, you know, while we still need to keep the lights on and keep payroll going and things like that using some pretty old systems, there is this drive to try to, you know, jump on some of the new um, technologies and, you know, really improve customer experience. So we've now got this kind of um, tension between basically the, you know, the, the traditional way that IT was done and, of course, now this new innovative way that IT can be done. And that's that whole bimodal um, approach, which, of course, Gartner talks about a lot. And finally, just convergence. We used to talk about you know, business versus IT, and there's many frameworks out there that try to separate those two, but really that's not the case anymore. What we're finding is that um, the two are not really separable anymore. You know, to talk about business versus IT is already putting yourself on the back foot. Those two work together. IT is an integral part of what business does. Right, so Gartner does a lot of work around forces and trends, so that's the sort of challenges we've been facing already. Now let's look at some of these challenges that are coming over the horizon. So we've got a number of forces heading our way over the next 18 months. So the you know, everything as a service side of things, you know, so obviously far more than you know, platform and infrastructure as a service, application as a service, it's you know, kind of everything as a service, and that kind of ties back into that cloud challenge that I was just talking about. The need to have open APIs, you know, everything should be able to collaborate. And so now you've kind of distributed your decision making and there's, you know, where is the single source of truth anymore? You know, everyone's got fragments of that. The whole mobile side of things and, you know, securing the whole mobile way that people are working now. And, you know, do you have your enterprise on your mobile device when you're sitting you know, on the train? Is that a legitimate um, business need? And of course, you know, more and more cloud push. 
looking out beyond the 18 months, so the sort of one to three year time frame, what Gartner are talking about and we're seeing as well is, you know, there really is a push to, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and looking for ways to exploit that, not just for the sake of it, but certainly where it's appropriate. And some industries are more aligned with that than others and can exploit it better than others. Internet of Things, I just talked about that, but that's really they're going to be the thing, you know, the volume of information that's coming um, into the um, the radar of what an enterprise architect has to deal with is, you know, really growing at, dare I say, an exponential rate. And then the big concept of digital twins, okay? Now, this is something that's really resonated with us, the concept of having basically some virtual um, view of your enterprise. And that's obviously beyond just the physical things. Historically, it was, you know, like a, a virtual um, model of a pump or something in a pumping station or some engineering construct. But now it's actually moving far beyond that into potentially a whole virtual model of the entire enterprise. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, so I promised you three secret weapons. Um, these are the things that we're seeing really are uh, making it possible for us as enterprise architects to cope with those challenges that are coming over the, the horizon and deal with the existing challenges that are there. So uh, basically we're looking at these three things. We're looking at speed, and I'll elaborate on these, so I'm not going to really go into them too much. We're looking at the use of digital twins, and I just... Um, uh, kind of indicated we're going to talk about that and then ultimately we're looking at leveraging these digital twin models that we have and running algorithms against them to get some insight that you otherwise wouldn't have got so it's these three things speed digital twins and algorithms they're three things that we as enterprise architects really look, need to be looking to to do over the next you know few years so let's have a look at the first weapon speed so you know, do you have super speed like flash Now, how are we able to do that? Well, you've heard Gartner talk about it before. I'm here to talk about it again, is basically we have what's called a graph database behind the scenes in Abacus. Now, a graph database is something you've probably started to hear a fair bit about. It's, it's certainly what's out there in the social media world, you know, the Facebook graph, you know, LinkedIn have a graph, you know, Twitter's graph, Microsoft talk about the enterprise graph. What is a graph database? Essentially, it's a faster way of storing and searching and processing. It has some big advantages around complexity because you don't have to presuppose what the relations are going to be and what the entities are going to be. Okay, like in a relational database, you have to define tables and relations and guff like that. You can get insights from a graph database through some very simple queries. Okay, so just you know who's connected to who and you know how many degrees of separation are there, which things are central to my organization. These are all graph queries and graph theory supports us for that. So we've leveraged that for over 20 years. So some pretty complex algorithms can come out of this graph way of thinking. And ultimately it's future proofed. So there is, you're never going to box yourself into a corner with a graph way of thinking. It's unlimited from a memory point of view. You know, you've got in-memory graph databases, all these great things. So it's fast, it's scalable, and obviously it's configurable and flexible. Another one of the big keys to delivering on speed is integrations, okay? If you don't have, you know, that you're open for, you know, interchange as one of your philosophies as a company, we use XML as one of our standard notations. So if you're not able to accept information from any number of other resources that are out there and repositories that are out there, you will end up becoming a peripheral repository. So I talked about how obviously this open API is a big driver. So where is the source of truth? Well, Abacus starts to become the single source of truth. It will just integrate faithfully with any third party repository. Remember, it's a graph database, so it will not transform their way of thinking into our way of thinking. We will just adopt and adapt the data structure that any third party repository has into Abacus. Now you may choose to only take a subset of that. You don't have to take everything, but whatever you do take, you have the choice of keeping it consistently matched to the third party repository. Now that means it's living and it's live and it's operationalized. You have direct data feeds from your operational things. You have data feeds from anything you want. And so this becomes this living repository that you know is always as accurate as anything you have in the enterprise. So that absolutely lets you have the best quality repository faster than any other approach. Now, 
you can get a bit megalomaniacal about this and you can start to you know obviously integrate with everything you know like where do you stop you know what what um, repositories should we integrate with we've done a lot of work around that and this is obviously the whole world of what are referred to as hybrid frameworks you know should you mash your PMO's way of thinking in with your you know CMDB's way of thinking in with your process you know capability modeling way of thinking you know these are all different areas and how do you mash these together well there's what we refer to as a Goldilocks zone where you look at essentially the number of entities so the number of things you have versus the number of relationships between those things. What we've found is that's around the sort of 30 to 50 mark. Okay, We've seen repositories with far more than that, but unfortunately they'll often become overly complex. So we always advocate you should have some sort of balanced repository where the same number of entities as relationships is there. So you kind of got that main diagonal. Ones that have more entities than relationships, we'll refer to as overloaded, and ones that have more relationships than entities, we'll refer to as over precise. So if we start dropping some of the frameworks that I'm sure you've heard onto the top of this, you start to see where we're talking. So things like TOGAF are actually pretty good, you know, for all the, the, the hundreds of pages that there are and, and the criticisms we've heard about that, you would know the open group is doing some work around that to try to simplify things. It is actually on that balanced um, kind of thing. Now, some of the frameworks like UML and Archimate, unfortunately, though, are overloaded. They have far more entity types than uh, relationship types. Now, not surprisingly, they um, you know, UML, which of course is is from the object management group, and Archimate grew out of that. Object management group is very object centric, so it's not surprising that they're overloaded. Anyway, so just be aware of that and think very carefully about that kind of Goldilocks zone and that main diagonal of where you think things uh, potentially should fit because you've got to beware of what we refer to as the Franken model. You know, don't just mash things together. You know, your left arm is TOGAF, your right arm is BPMN, your left leg is, I don't know, ITIL, your right leg is, you know, you know, some sort of, you know, P3O or something like that. You know, you've got to be very careful how you mash these things together because the whole may not be greater than the parts if you're not careful. So we talk about that as a Franken model. You want to have some consistency. Now, we, of course, have been doing this for 20 years, making hybrid frameworks. It's as simple as drag and drops. So we have some very good understandings of where there is synergies between frameworks and where there isn't. We've of course pre-configured frameworks and hybrids of you know the best practices from different fields together and we deploy those. None of the libraries are, um, cost you anything in Abacus, they're all freely available. You can download them from the community and most of them are bundled into the, the release as we release them. So beware though, beware. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Okay, let's have a look at secret weapon number two. What we're talking about here is digital twins. So I know you probably recognize this as you know, Neo in the matrix. So you know, are we all living inside a matrix? You know, is this really just a simulation? Well, wouldn't that actually be nice if we could have that for an enterprise? You know, that's fundamentally what a digital twin is. We're saying that this is a virtual view of the enterprise. It's a digitalized business. You've taken your business and you've digitalized it. You've turned it into a model, a repository that you can then do things with. So that's fundamentally that whole premise behind the matrix. Is wouldn't it be wonderful if we actually had this thing, this digital twin of our enterprise that we could now ask it questions and we could experiment on and find out what the consequence of those experiments would be. So architecture is the heart of that digitalization. So whether you choose, as we've talked about, the TOGAFs or anything like that, you know, there's ways of approaching the digitalization or the digital business as it's shortened to through using architecture. So there are, of course, um, guidance around how you should set up your practice to do that. There's guidance around frameworks, there's meta models, there's graphs, there's, you know, all of these different things that architecture brings to the table, of course, as a way of digitalizing a business. Now, I know I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, we're all enterprise architects and it's in our title. So we understand, hopefully, that architecture is the way to realize this digital twin and to realize the understanding of a digital business. But if we don't collaborate and democratize this, if we don't push this out to everyone and have everyone be involved in solving this problem, then unfortunately, it's going to end up being just another repository on the shelf that gets out of date. So Abacus integrates and is deployable through the different collaboration platforms. We certainly can have it inside Teams here, Microsoft's um, product for collaborations, you know, the Slack competitor. So what that means is, you know, people simply join a channel in a team and they're presented an Abacus 
um, dashboard and they're able to start interacting with that dashboard, updating the things that are relevant to them according to the permissions that they might have, seeing how things change in real time and seeing how things are working right there in an environment they're familiar with. You know, they never need to go off and you know, log into the Abacus um, product. It's all single sign on through Active Directory integration and stuff like that. But it's right there and then when people need that answer, you know, people are very time poor. So you get the answer right there, which of course encourages people to help and help solve the problem and clean up the quality of the data. Okay, so you need to get this collaboration and you need to push it out to the people who own the information. Don't sit in the ivory tower and gather you know, feeds and then try to do all the validation. Get the people to own their information and work with you moving forward. Let's bring us to the third algorithm we we're talking about. Sorry, the third weapon we're talking about, which is algorithms. I hope some of you recognize this as a scene from um, Terminator, the movie, or it's actually uh, it's over 35 years ago now. Oh, do the math. Um, and yeah, essentially this is where you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character, the, the Terminator, is assessing this man to see whether he can have his boots, his clothes, and his motorcycle. So that's it. You know, algorithms are obviously a, a thing that's um, talked about a lot, and absolutely it's one of our weapons that we can bring to the table as architects. You know, putting some science to this stuff, you know, some numbers. So it's not just qualitative recommendations, it's also quantitative recommendation. So it's of course the key to making smarter decisions faster, which you would remember is that um, third use case that, that Gartner talk about for the critical capabilities for um, EA tools. And ultimately, what it's helping you do is as an architect, it's give guidance to the business for the different scenarios and the different challenges they're looking at doing. So of course you can answer questions like, you know, how much is something gonna cost? You know, when's it gonna be available? Will it be simpler? Will my business scale? It's all these kind of what if questions that algorithms can put some science to and are powered by an architectural way of thinking. It cuts across these sorts of concepts. So now we start talking about algorithms and roadmaps and measures, outcomes. Obviously what you're looking at taking is your kind of current state understanding of a business. So that's a representation you have, we can call it a digital twin. It's now looking at different measures that you could take from that current state. So that's using algorithms to understand the different measures or KPIs that you um, have now. So yeah, what is your, you know, your costs? What are your quality of service? Whatever the different KPIs might be. Um, it's looking at a future state or a target architecture. So that's another variation of the digital twin. Okay, so this ability to have multiple um, architectures as we call them in a single repository. So you have multiple different versions or different scenarios you can be playing with and trading off against each other and seeing how that potential or each different potential um, target stacks up against the same set of measures that you care about and obviously hoping that it's better and that's you know trying to find the one that's um, better. So that proves that there is something that's feasible, that we can actually have something that is a better architecture and it meets our business outcomes and our business objectives better than our current um, business. So it's feasible that it is possible to have that. And then the whole work of road mapping is of course understanding how to get from point A to point B. How do we actually now um, move our current business to this new future business and prove that the actual future state is reachable? Okay, that's all done through your architecture and using algorithms as a guiding set to guide you on the most optimal path to get from point A to point B. Just a quick um, summary of the sort of different types of algorithms there are. Last year I presented uh, quite extensively about the different algorithms that we, we have. And of course we've got even more than we had last year. I don't have time to go into them now. Um, really there's sort of four types of algorithms that we talk about. There's algorithms that work at like a property level. So they might be just a you know kind of a cost analysis and they update some properties. There's algorithms that work at a structural level. So they start to apply patterns and they start to look for patterns and they start to evolve into different future state structural architectures. So, you know, breaking up things, adding things, connecting things. Okay, there are algorithms that are about creating different visualizations. Okay, so you can dynamically generate things according to different rules and different um, kind of formulas that you have. And ultimately, there's algorithms that will produce entire new architectures according to different goals and different things that you have. So there's kind of that increasing level of complexity there from properties through structures to you know, visualizations through to architectures. And that of course ties back into your concepts of what people traditionally call analysis, modeling, presentation, and then obviously what's referred to as road mapping. 
Now I'm going to just run through a couple of examples here. Again, I, I've done this previously, so I'm just going to sort of flash through them. These aren't broken up into those four different types of algorithms um, that I just talked about. It's just sort of, sort of different examples. It's a coincidence that there's actually four of them here. But you know, there's financial algorithms where essentially we're looking at you know, measuring the cost or the profit or whatever it might be, some financial metric, but then leveraging our graph structure to reason about the contributors to that, the flow of money in our business, where the costs are being borne and what the impact of that cost is. So we're attributing these costs along the relationships that we have in our graph. So you might understand the physical costs, but now understanding where they are attributable to from a logical point of view at the process area or the capabilities or something like that. Okay. Um, they can be visualized, of course, with some you know, pretty good sort of visualizations here where we sort of show some burn down charts or some cost projections. You know, there's the attributed to you know, different suppliers and all these good things. So there's lots of good ways that you can start to visualize how the financial side of things might be going over the next few years out of these algorithms that we have. There's a whole lot of algorithms that talk around complexity and complexity and dependency are pretty closely related so that we start to understand, well, you know, kind of like the cheesy pizza thing. If I pull the slice of pizza out, what comes with it? So what we can start to understand is kind of where are the critical things in our business? Where are the things that are potentially contributing the most? Where are the things that are potentially the most vulnerable in our business? And that all comes down to interconnectivity and connectedness, okay? So there's algorithms, there's graph theory that tells us, you know, how interconnected things are, uh, which things are the most um, central things to our, our enterprise. And so we can leverage all those different um, algorithms in Abacus using our graph database and, and some different algorithms. You might now present that purely in a heat mapping sense. Okay, so at a capability model on the left there, we might just be saying you know, red means these areas are very complex in our business. So we surface the underlying complexity analysis at, in this case, the capability level. Okay, you might show it at the application level. That bottom right bubble chart is actually looking at the kind of complexity around different applications. Okay, so which ones are doing the most amount of data transformation? You know, aggregating information in and then pushing information out. You know, which ones are really heavily complex from an application complexity point of view? So these are all different complexity analysis you can use to guide, of course, your decision making. Um, availability algorithms. So these ones are looking at, well, what happens when something goes wrong? You know, what happens if, you know, something, some part of our business fails? What is the ripple effect? Okay, so we use different algorithms, you know, Monte Carlo and things like that to understand the implications of failure. So, you know, if we've got an SLA saying we need, you know, five nines of availability, what is the actual consequence of that from a customer's point of view? You know, how often will our website go down? You know, if there's some aspect of it that, um, you know, we know is a bit vulnerable. That again can be visualized through different ways. You know, we've got a heat mapping on the left here, which you know shows clearly the ripple effect of some server going down, showing that it goes all the way up to affecting you know, various operations in Asia Pacific, you know, here, China, Korea, and Australia, because you know that aspect of our business is down. So lots of great ways of visualizing these types of things. The last one I want to just talk through is, is, a, is a pretty advanced one. This is around performance stuff. It's where you're starting to look at where are bottlenecks in your system, where are things going to be queuing, where are we going to be missing our deadlines, where are we you know, going to have customers that are not getting the responsiveness that they need. So Abacus, of course, has a whole lot of algorithms around that using discrete event simulation. And again, the way you can visualize these things is, you know, some interesting charts here. This one on the left is showing you essentially how long is it taking to process things versus how long should we be processing them or the deadline. That yellow line is the deadline. So we can already see a couple of our critical transactions are missing their deadline. Okay, so that, of course, is going to be leaving some um, queuing and leaving some resource exhaustion in those areas. So we can start to do all those kind of advanced um, algorithms. So just to wrap up. Those secret weapons again, so you want to get things into your repository quick, so you want to have speed, you want your repository to be digitalized, collaborative, democratized, so that's you know, what's referred to as a digital twin, and then you want to leverage that repository and that graph way of thinking to actually come up with numbers that no one else in your business can come up with. That's the strength of what an enterprise architect has if they're following this type of approach. So whether they're financial or environmental or technical algorithms, running these algorithms and being able to give insight to the business that no one else can.